Hello. Okay, so last time in video number 19, I talked about how the great god Thor was uh, humiliated and ridiculed in the Edda poem Harbard's Ljud, the Song of Longbeard. If you haven't seen that, you need to see this, that first, because this is a direct continuation of that talk. So, I recently saw a very good Chinese Kung Fu movie. Um, it is called Fearless and stars Jet Li, one of my favorite actors. Now, um, the time for seeing that movie was perfect, because it is about a very ancient theme. The story is about how a young man, Jet Li's character, who has trained Kung Fu all his life um, and is now almost unbeatable. He takes down one champion after the other and is very proud of himself. Yes, he's a great fighter, uh, but there is no wisdom in him. The driving force behind his learning Kung Fu in the first place is a fear of humiliation and loss and a need to show them all. Uh, he gets into brawls, he drinks, he thinks that winning fame by winning fights is the meaning of life and what gives him worth. And his students are bullies with his blessing. Uh, now one day he ends up killing an opponent um, for a perceived offense, uh, giving into rage without actually having investigated the circumstances that led to the fight. Turns out that Jet Li's character was wrong uh, about his opponent and the, that he has now killed a very honorable man, widowed a decent woman and made an innocent child fatherless. Also there are repercussions and his own mother and daughter are killed. Jet Li's character almost tries to avenge himself before he understands that he himself is to blame. He realizes that he has been incredibly boastful, blind, stupid, ruthless and cruel and that despite his winning a fight he has lost his honor and his face. Everything in his life falls apart and he leaves his home and almost dies in the wilderness. However, he is picked up by a humble farmer's family and lives with an old peasant grandmother and her blind daughter for several years, learning to appreciate the earth, humility and simplicity. Through gentleness, he finds his true spiritual strength, which ultimately leads him to become a greater warrior than before. When he finally returns to, to, his, to the city, he has truly become a great master who acts with true courage and true fearlessness, for he no longer fears losing, and he has no need to show off for his own sake. He has learned to not abuse the power of his supreme fighting skills. Now this theme... Um, this, this is a theme that repeats itself in many stories, especially warrior stories. You have the Karate Kid movies, for example, where the theme always is a young foolish boy wishes to learn to fight to get back at his enemies, yet encounters wise teacher who, often through humiliation, teaches him to be humble, perceptive, meek, soft, respectful and invincible. A similar idea is found in Taoism, where it is said that a master of Tao, if he is a man, needs to become like a woman. Now, not to become a transvestite, but to assume the qualities that are traditionally associated with women. Perceptivity, humbleness, meekness, gentleness, weakness. Only with those qualities may Tao, the force, enter the body and mind, and wisdom be birthed from within. Now, in many shamanistic traditions, a very important part of the initiation is to break down the initiate's pride, boastfulness and self-importance. You get nowhere you see spiritually through banging your chest. If anyone has read the books of Carlos Castaneda, for example, great books, you may have noticed how much poor Carlos is teased by his teacher and how hard it is for him to let go of his self-importance. But the teacher says to him that uh, self-importance and self-pity are the greatest obstacles to wisdom and transformation on the path of the spiritual warrior. And this is especially valid, they say, for men who are taught and raised to be self-important. Um, I personally have had many teachers and one of them was a Siberian shaman, a man who told me that it is so easy for women to learn and to change because we are flexible, 
because we listen and are perceptive and humble and often assume the position of someone who learns. And the only thing women generally have to work with, he said, is self-confidence. Given that, there is no limit to the speed and efficiency with which a woman can transform into wisdom and light. Men, on the other hand, he said, struggle, uh, often for a lifetime, with the obstacles of self-importance, self-pity and boasting. They want to teach before they have learned. They want to bang their chests. They want to show off. They have heavy energies, um, like Thor, if you recall my last video. The shaman told me that the most important and difficult part of learning, for men especially, is the breakdown of the ego. Um, as far as I've been able to observe in the world, I think this is very true. I think that generally women and men who are on the, sp on the path of spiritual transformation all struggle with the same things and that the major differences between women and men is that women struggle with lack of self-worth while men struggle with well, they also struggle with lack of self-worth, but this real and innermost insecurity is in men often hidden behind thick layers of pride, boasting and learned self-importance. Uh, well, as I think I have made clear, this is not a modern phenomenon. You find traditions stressing these same obstacles all over the world and in many indigenous cultures and kung fu movies. Um, sometimes, often. A prideful man needs to learn humility in order to learn true greatness. Sometimes the higher and more blinding the pride, the greater is the humiliation applied in order to break down the obstacle of self-importance. The moment an ego is broken down, it is easier to access new wisdom. Uh, many shamanistic and other spiritual traditions have develop strong guidelines for how to expose a young man to humiliation in order to teach him humility. And this appears to have been true also in the Norse tradition, in which, if you saw my video number 18, initiates, young men were often met and attacked and taunted by monstrous women. I think that in, in macho cultures like the Old Norse, being taunted and teased by females is a monstrous experience for young men. Uh, the grace and fearless acceptance with which the young men met this humiliation determined the outcome and success of their initiation. They succeeded when they handled that treatment and the initial fear with grace, often calling the monster beautiful, and then seeing how she turns into a helpful creature. Uh, in at least one of the stories, the she-monster actually reveals that this was a test, a test that few could pass, and then she turns into a beautiful bride. Uh, so going back to Thor, you may now understand where I'm going. In my last video, the son of Earth encountered a teacher who showed him that no matter how heroic and strong and invincible a warrior he was, he could not get into the divine realms by boasting that. He is humiliated and ridiculed and told that his course of action is wrong. Uh, we told how he struggled with the she-wolves, the she-wolves who attacked his paradigm of beliefs, and how he reacted with rage rather than learning. The fact that the women wore wolf cloth signifies death, the death of his ego, which, if he had accepted it, would have led him to discover the beautiful brides the, re the women really were. Uh, sadly, Thor's encounter with the she-wolves is a test that Thor witlessly fails because he's so eager to defend the mental system he had worked so hard to build. A similar myth is told by Snorri actually uh, in the story. Thor goes to Utgard, the, the, the outer world, and tries to act a big man, only to be shown time and time again how small and insignificant he is among the real powers of the universe. It is a long story, so I won't retell it here, but it's available in the prose edda. Now, in the end of the last video, I told you how Thor, in the Harbard's Ljud poem, finally has the, the wits to ask how, how he would be able to reach the divine lands. And he was told that he had to follow the path to that land until he was found by his mother, the earth, and that she would help him to find the way. And Thor, a bit uncertain if he's being teased or told the truth, walks away. 
uh, and we don't learn more in that poem because it ends there but something obviously gave it took some time though um, in the next poem about Thor, we learn how he wakes up one morning and realizes that he has lost his hammer. <coughs> uh, I'm going to cite the beginning line of that poem, uh, the Thrymskvida, in Old Norse, just because it's so beautiful in Old Norse, and it goes like this. Raid vård och vingthor, då han vaknade, och sin hamars han saknade. Um, this means angry was winged Thor when he awoke and missed his hammer. Uh, now, so Thor immediately seeks the great shaman of the gods, Loki. We tend to think of Loki as a bad guy because, um, because of the way he acts sometimes, but the truth is that he's just rather complicated, just like a human being. Loki, more than willing to serve Thor, immediately goes on to Freya, the great goddess of the shamans, and asks if she will kindly let him her falcon hide. And um, a point is made out of how happy the goddess is that he asks, and she gladly accepts. Loki flies off in her falcon body until he comes to the world of the giants, to be exact, the world of Trim, whose name means drum. There are some shamanistic aspects here, you see, drumming, shape changing, going into other worlds to seek answers. Um, the giant Trim says, admits, that he has got the hammer and that he will return it if the Aesir, the gods, bring him the goddess Freya as a wife. Loki returns with the message and Thor, thoughtlessly, runs to Freya and tells her to get ready for marriage with the giant upon which the goddess displays her independence and power and makes the whole earth tremble and shake with her rage. In short, she blankly refuses. Now, um, a point has been made in Freya's two reactions to two different requests. Freya, uh, as a metaphor, represents soul, light and wisdom, immortality even. The soul, light and wisdom is happy when someone wishes to seek for knowledge, like Loki did when he asked for the falcon hide. She gets angry, however, when someone wishes to marry her off to the forces of destruction and greed. It is a metaphor. So, uh, sorry. And um, all the gods gather in parliament. Um, it is of vital importance that Thor retrieves his hammer because this is necessary in order to defend Earth and the gods from the destructive forces of the outer world. The wise god Heimdall, who represents the universe, suggests that Thor dress up like a bride himself in order to trick the giant Trim into giving him his hammer. Thor protests, claiming that the Aesir will laugh of him and call him unmanly if he dresses up like a woman. But then Loki intervenes and tells him that he must do what is needed and not think about his male pride before the welfare of the gods. Thor has to accept. <clears throat> and Loki, who never had a problem with cross-dressing, helps Thor to dress up like a maiden. The two of them go to the world of the drum in the shapes of a bride and her handmaiden. And at the wedding, the giant places Thor's hammer in the bride's lap in order to seal the marriage. A rather symbolic act. In fact, the groom placing uh, Thor's hammer in the bride's lap symbolizes penetration. And to Thor, who is known as the Mandy God, even the symbolic act of being penetrated by another male is a moment of utter emasculation and humiliation. Yet, it is in this moment of humiliation, when the hammer is placed in his lap as if he was a bride, the very opposite of what Thor is. It is then that Thor throws his head back and laughs. Laughs because he realizes that it is now that he will retrieve his true power. He seizes the hammer, kills the giant and the giant's sister who has asked him for his red rings. The sister symbolizes old age and death and the red rings symbolize life. So this means that Thor manages to conquer death. <coughs> so, uh, sorry again. I see this in connection with the first story. Thor failed the first test of initiation because he started to fight the she-wolves who attacked his masculine ego paradigm and self-image. Then, a new and even more humiliating test is presented to him, in which he himself has to assume the role of a woman. 
In this context, we should say a couple of things about old Norse pagan attitudes towards gender roles. This is not what you're going to see in the mainstream textbooks, but it's 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 all there if you study a bit deeper. Uh, it's generally acknowledged. Um, Old Norse society was obviously patriarchal and strictly gender divided. Women were highly respected for wisdom and medicine skills and actually ruled the economy, but men ruled the spheres of politics and war, and there were strict codes of masculine honor. Homosexuality was acceptable behavior. Yes, it was. Of that there is ample evidence, yet there are quite a number of examples from Old Norse texts where men who had been lovers before argued, in public, for all to hear about it, about who had played the active masculine penetrating part in the relationship. What can we learn about that? From that, we learned that Norse men who had sex with men were open about it and felt no shame, but that they would feel embarrassed if people thought that they had been the femme of their relationship. They were not persecuted for it, they were not attacked, there was no punishment. Obviously, homosexuality was one of those things that happened and that people knew about. Uh, but if the man in question was a warrior and one of those fierce Vikings, his manliness could be doubted. If there was a rumor that he had been the passive, receptive part of the act, this could be a source of amusement and it could be used to tease and taunt. What about cross-dressing? Well, the fact is that there is loads of evidence from archaeology that some sort of transgender behavior happened and was recognized acknowledged behavior with a place of its very own within the otherwise rather gender divided Norse pagan society. They even had a title reserved for male to female transsexuals, and that was Seidberender, which means a womb by Seidir, or in other words, a magical vagina. This title was often applied to male shamans. Transgender behavior and lifestyles happened and it seemed to have happened within the context of shamanism, ritual and religion. Norse Viking Age society was a society with clear-cut gender roles but without church doctrines and without sexual moralism in, in the same sense as we know it. When children emerged who clearly did not fit into the expected gender roles, they were not considered freaks, they were considered magical, special, and sent off to learn magic. Some boys returned from their initiations with so-called magical wombs, and there was a space for them in Norse society. Only later on, when Christian descendants wrote down the lore of their Norse pagan ancestors, did they feel a certain embarrassment about these facts, and wrote that there were aspects about ancestral teachings that were sexually perverted. Um, archaeology, however, shows that these special people were acknowledged and uh, buried as gender benders with all due respect. I think that um, I think that Thor's trial of cross-dressing, which to him, the manly god, was a tremendously difficult trial, is an example of what is amply documented from the Norse material, namely that cross-dressing and gender bending often took place in a ritual context and even so for those who usually fitted into the norm of male-female polarity. Why? Well, I think that in a society where gender differences are the norm, gender bending is potentially a very powerfully transformative experience. The more unthinkable it is to act the opposite gender, the more effect such an act will have on the mind. When a society makes gender into such a big issue, as it was in the Norse world, the application of the role of the other gender could be a deeply transformative experience. Everything you thought you knew about yourself would be dissolved. Anyone who ever tried to be the opposite of what they thought they were knows what a great mind-opening power there is in this. And this is possibly a reason why this technique was applied in many ancient, uh, especially shamanistic traditions. Um, so obviously this is another and more complete story telling the same tale. At initiation there is a very important paradox, the need to let go of pride and self-importance, of the male ego even, if one is to retrieve one's true lost potential, one's true power. 
Uh, in another story told by Snorri, Thor is challenged by the giants to come and visit them without all his weapons and gear. As we know, Thor has a power belt, two iron gloves and a hammer that represents lightning, perhaps even electricity, and that is also symbolic of power and manliness. He often fights giantesses who hurl rocks towards Middle Earth, and a giantess representing death and old age is his sworn enemy, one he always tries to conquer. However, in this story, he must show his true courage by walking unprotected uh, into the giant world with his iron gloves, without his hammer and without his power belt. Suddenly, it occurs to him to seek the aid of his old enemies. He seeks the cave of a giantess called Gridr. Her name means truce, which tells a lot. And she is the mother of Odin's son Vidar, Vidar the Silent. Vidar means to expand. It gives me at least uh, associations to the expansion of the mind and the spirit when inner silence is reached. In fact, I think this is what Vidar the Silent represents. He's one of those gods that only appears in poetry, a pure metaphor for silent expansion of spirit. And that Gridr, by being his metaphorical mother, is the one who helps birthing this state of consciousness in Thor. Thor spends some time with the giantess in the cave, where she teaches him how to conquer his enemy. The enemy is the giant red spear and his daughters, who literally piss the waters of death in which Thor later almost drowns. Uh, red spear, of course, is another metaphor for death. Uh, I analyze this story as such, that the giantess representing a wise woman or a witch, and also representing the earth, because the earth is a giantess. And as you know, Thor was told to let Earth show him the way to the spirit lands. So this is what happens. Um, and when Thor has finished his apprenticeship with the giantess, uh, she lends him her power wand, indicating that she is a witch indeed, and also her very own power belt and her iron gloves. In this way, Thor is again armed, only this time with the weapons of the old lady, representing wisdom perhaps. And needless to say, he wins the battle eventually. So, we have a red thread between the various Thor myths here. In the last video, Thor was told to seek his mother Earth for guidance. In another story, a giantess in a cave who could very well represent the Earth offers him guidance and he conquers death. In two stories now, Thor has had to give up his attributes, his hammer and his manhood, in order to succeed. In one, he had to become a humble um, maiden bride, and in another he had to go unprotected and apply the weapons of an old woman. It's all about letting down the god of self-importance and discover one's true courage behind the mask. In a third story, Thor becomes a young boy in order to complete his task. Uh, and this could signify becoming like a child again, like when you take off the masks of your self-image, you will find in your, you know, the inner child, the, the one who learns. And the story is the Hymiskvida, the song of Hymn, it means. Hymir, Hymn, is a giant of frost. And that story begins with another giant, Egir. Egir is the father of the nine giantesses who birthed the universe and who manifest as light or waves, and he is husband to Ran, who receives the dead in her net. He lives on the island called Lese, the wind-shielded island. We have been talking about that place a few times now, and basically this is the island of immortality, associated with the cosmic ocean below the world's tree, an ocean that provides the water to the three cosmic wells, the well of memory, the well of fate, and the well of death and renewal. All of them basically the same well. Uh, Egir, who then lords it over the immortal realms, invite the gods to a party there. Now, remember one thing. The gods, the Norse gods, the Aesir, were not immortal. They were completely dependent on the goddess Eden, the aspect of the great goddess that offers the apples of eternal resurrection. Every year they have to eat these apples and will grow old and die unless she offers these fruits to them. Thus the gods are long lived uh, through the help of the lady but not immortal. 
So being invited to the island of immortality is a big thing for them. But in order to get there and party, they have to bring a cauldron that is big enough to hold all the mead of Egir. The task falls on Thor, who accompanied by the god of war, Tyr, travels to the outer world of the giants. In the outer world, Rian, a giant called Hymir, Hymn, a frost giant, owns a cauldron that has the appropriate quality. When Thor and Tyr arrive in his halls, they are lucky to find that the giant is out for the day. But someone else is there, Thor's maternal grandmother, and she's a scary one. The poem goes, To the lad, grandmother was fierce to behold. Nine hundred heads the old one had. But another came forward, all bright and golden. Bright broad, she offered strong drink to her son. Uh, now, we know that Thor's mother is the Earth, so the golden friendly woman is actually his mother Earth, the very person he was told to seek for help and guidance. Earth's mother, we know, is not, which means night, a terrifying giantess which, uh, with, as he said, 900 heads. The theme is one of endless repetition in the Norse material. Uh, we have now uh, we have by now seen countless stories in which the hero of the initiation stories is met with a horrible ogress and a beautiful woman. Sometimes the two are just aspects of the same person. It is this life uh, it is the life death contradiction. In any case, as the gods do not let themselves become too terrified of the ogress, the beautiful and benevolent maiden aspect appears from that ogress and offers strong beer, a symbol of the initiation. She also offers counsel, and because of her advice and warnings, Thor manages to conquer the giant humid. Uh, in the same story, Thor also goes on a fishing trip and almost fishes the middle world serpent. Famous story, full of meaning. Sadly, I can't go into every detail about the Thor mythology here, it's too much. Um, but uh, anyway, we uh, let us stay with a particular red thread of essentials. With the help of his mother Earth, Thor manages to outwit humid. He puts the cauldron, oh, cauldron over his head so that it covers his entire body, a metaphor for something, and runs off. Uh, because of his success, he is able to reach the island of immortality and let the gods drink the mead of memory, wisdom and resurrection. This is Thor's gift to them. He also manages to retrieve his wife. Remember how Odin mocked Thor because his wife Sif was being unfaithful? Actually, it turns out that the lady had only tried to help Loki offering him the meat of, meat of the gods with the hope that he should calm down and find uh, wisdom. But the god of jealousy and intrigue abuses the gift. That, however, is a different story. The most important thing is that Thor, at the island of immortality, takes his wife back and does his own fate back. Through trials harsher to him than any giant opponent, Trials that require him to let go of his pride, his boastfulness, his masculinity even, his protection, his very identity. Trials that requires him to seek guidance from women um, and even apply female qualities. Through all this humiliation, he finally retrieves all his powers and reaches the island of immortality. Have a nice day.